This is Jeremiah Riggins from Sanctuary Family Farms. I'm married to Katie Riggins, and we have two boys, um, Ben and Sam, who are 10 and 13 years old. What is control? In a simple way, control is our attempt to try and get what we want from the circumstances around us. It is an attempt to remove anything negative or uncomfortable from the situations we are in. People typically control situations in order to remove anything that causes negative feelings. Where does control come from? Come from? Control almost always comes from distorted beliefs. These beliefs are almost always developed from childhood learning in our families or from any trauma in our life. The earlier the trauma, the more intense the belief. It is these beliefs or negative memories that trigger the negative emotions that we attempt to avoid. Let's look at an example. If I'm really honest about it, I grew up feeling pretty insecure in my relationships. Although I knew I was loved, at the back of my head there was a fear that it could be gone at any time. I was a sensitive kid, and to a large extent, I still am. When I was younger, my dad struggled a lot with anger problems stemming from childhood abuse and neglect. He would have these intense moments where his anger would flare up, and then he would, re then he would rein it back in. Often he did this by isolating himself and being quiet. If I was the one that he was angry with, these periods of quietness felt like rejection. Being the sensitive kid that I was, I felt this very deeply. I now realize that he was doing the best he could to not expose me to the anger, but as a child, it just felt like punishment through the removal of affection. Consequently, I developed all kinds of coping mechanisms to control the emotions of the situation. I would cope with this by almost begging for reassurance that things would be okay. I went through a period when I apologized for almost everything, even things that were not my fault. At times, I would get angry and isolate myself. You can't be rejected if you already rejected those around you. At times, I still struggle with feelings of rejection. In my marriage, if I feel like I am being ignored or minimized in some way, it triggers some of the same feelings from my childhood. I can become angry and at times have an inability to drop an argument until I feel it is resolved and everything is okay. So the emotions and feelings that I felt in childhood affect my need to control in my adult relationships. Here's a good exercise for everyone to try. Think about the last time you tried to control or manipulate a situation. What emotions were triggered for you? What part of your life did they come from? The real problem with the need for control is that beliefs and emotions associated with this need are rarely grounded in reality. In my earlier example, as I have gotten older and have my own children, I now know that my parents were never going to reject me. I know that no matter how, how mad we got with each other, we, we were and will always come back to the relationship. I also know that even if all my fears were true, I am still fearfully and wonderfully made. And no matter what, Jesus loves me. So even though I felt like I could lose the love and approval or that I was a failure, this was never the reality with them or with God. So now that we know that much of our control comes from a need to avoid negative emotions or memories from our past, what do we do about it? Earlier I mentioned how we might identify where these memories and emotions come from. Although this can be helpful, it is not necessary in stopping our control. One of the important things to do to reduce our unhealthy control is to ground our thoughts in His truth by holding our controlling beliefs up to the Scripture. There are four scriptures that I base my truth on. 1. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, that my soul knoweth right well. Psalms 139.14 If I am made by God, and God does not make mistakes, then how I am is how he wants me. I must accept his plan for me. 2. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live, in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 2.20 If Jesus loves me, then I have faith that there is no other love that I need. He is enough, and I can be content in him. 3. If ye then, be, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? Matthew 7.11 This reminds me that God sees me as one of his children. He will give me what I need, even uh, he will give me what I need, even more than I do for my own children who I love. Four, and we know that all things work together for the good of them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. Romans eight twenty eight. 
This scripture helps me to see that whatever I'm dealing with is part of his plan. He has a purpose for my life, so when I struggle, I just focus on him and his plan. These are four truths that I can ground my reality in. When I believe in the truth of the word, I do not have to react to the emotions that come up. Next time I write, I will talk about how we reduce our control through radical dependence on him and his plan. Until next time, walk in his love, acceptance, and perfect plan. Big subject there, hard subject, subject that relates to everybody. Um, I think, you know, being part of your blog, I can <laughs> assess to the fact that, yes, uh, my stepfather was <clears throat> extremely harsh, cruel, uh, punitive. Uh, I always walked in fear of him, never knowing when he was going to be explosive or what he was going to do uh, physically, emotionally, mentally. Then my mother, on the other hand, was an adult child of an alcoholic parent who died a raging alcoholic in an institution. So in all of that, I never thought of myself as being the second generation of an alcoholic parent's parent. And <clears throat> I think maybe getting to the core of control, when I think about it, I think too that most of the time we're trying to control things so that they don't hurt us, harm us, embarrass us, or that they're not disappointing to us. What do you think about that? Uh, yeah, I think that's a hundred percent true. Um, when I was still counseling, I used to have a, I would always say, you know, humans are the only primates on the face of the planet that will fight because you tell them they're ugly, um, or because you don't include them in something. You know, you never see one monkey trying to kill another monkey because he points at him funny. So, yeah, 100%. We get triggered by all of these kind of things, and it can trigger intense responses in us. And, and um, As humans, it triggers responses that are nearly survival level for um, emotional, um, emotional trauma, psychological trauma, insults, mm -hmm. um, hmm. loss of support, things like that. So, yeah, for sure. And, you know, sometimes I think that in control, when you're trying to control something, we're trying to control how I, I perceive myself as successful, how I don't want to be a failure, but it doesn't come across that way. It comes across as the person who frustrated me is the failure, not me. And, you know, I think of the other scripture in the Bible that says you should know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Yeah. And I think basically trying to understand the truth of ourself, of what's expected of us, of God, and how we can detach ourselves from from the um, from the things that are going on that we become inflamed about. And and I, you know, yep. I, I like what you yep. said. Four steps, very good. Uh, recognizing who I am, uh, you know. I, I suppose if there were a guideline, I never had a guideline of perfection. I never had a guideline of a father. I didn't know what a father was. I never met my real father. So I didn't know what a father was. If fathers were the stepfather I had, then, oh my, oh my, that was something I didn't want to emulate, though at times I did. So how do we get out of that quagmire? Yeah, I think you hit on something, and something that I may not have, have thought about before. Like, I kind of know it at the back of my head, but you kind of really formalized it for me, is this idea that control is really a cover for truth. So think about it this way. If you have somebody who's a, a at the core is, a, is afraid or a coward, mm -hmm. and then they control that fear of being a coward by pumping themselves up, being machismo, being aggressive, being violent, all that kind of stuff, they're really only covering the truth on the outside that they're really cowards on the inside. Mm -hmm. And so versus if this, this idea of real courage is unflinchingly accepting the truth which would be accepting that you're a coward once you if you accept that you're a coward there's room to move out of it if you simply cover it over with leather jackets and 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 long hair and what you know whatever else you're never going to change the core of being a coward so maybe that's part of what the scriptures are is this idea of like I'm fearfully and wonderfully made Jesus loves me all of that 
maybe those just give us the courage to start facing the truth and in, in, in that reality to really start facing those things and changing that rather than just trying to control it. Yeah, I think the opposite is true. The behavior sometimes is opposite of what's indicative of the mm-hmm. inside, like you said. Because I know I always thought I was a coward, but I always believed I was a coward because I, I couldn't live up to the expectation of my mother by confronting a raging stepfather. Mm-hmm. Even when I was 8, 10 years old, it was almost that I felt a perception, you ought to defend me, you ought to stand up for me, you ought to fight him. And I thought I should too. And therefore, I conclude I was a coward because I didn't. But all, but look at it this way, too. So as you get older, committing to committing yourself to never being a coward again, in some ways, only reinforces that you were a coward when you were a kid. Mm-hmm. Rather than addressing the fact that you were a kid, like you've said before, addressing that you were a kid and that there was nothing that you could really do about that situation being a kid, that's the only thing that's going to allow that, that child to move forward or you to heal that piece inside of you because committing to never being a coward again and never being in that situation again only reinforces that you are a coward, which isn't true. Well, I think it it grows with you because being a coward was what was planted in my mind when I was 8 or 10. And as I grew older, I never grew out of it because Mm -hmm. the thinking in my mind is a coward's always a coward. Mm -hmm. Uh, And maybe that's true. A coward is always a coward. The question is... Does what I did constitute being a coward? Right, right, which is where the truth is found, not in never being that way or compensating for it, because compensation only reinforces the truth. Mm-hmm. And I'm afraid that. It only reinforces the belief. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. You know, until I looked at it and I put myself, I stood out of my memory and saw myself right there and seeing this rageaholic screaming and yelling and threatening and, 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 terrifying everybody around him because that was his uh, that was his motive I mean his motive was to do that to scare people to stay away from him because he didn't want to reveal who he was either mm-hmm. um, but when I saw that when I, I became and I looked at as an adult looking back at a 10 year old boy and I asked myself the question would would I expect that of a 10 year old boy in the same situation and I'm like no I would have never expected that I would expect him running high be quiet to get your head taken off. Mm-hmm. Would not expecting him to fall, but I did not see that until many, many, many years later. Because I did know how to substitute, or mm, what would we use the word in psychology? I didn't know how to uh, uh, trans uh, translate. Um, put myself in that situation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think one way we just I've described it before is it's like uh, you function as adult, but because you hold the beliefs from your childhood, you still hold parts of your brain where you think like a child, and so you use adult intelligence with child rationality. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, Paul said when I was a child, I thought as a child, I understood as a child. When I became an adult, I put away childish thinking. I think that's a hard thing because then we have to come up with a what is the definition of an adult? Mm-hmm. I mean, the scripture you said, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, I think that's a great place to start with mm-hmm. who I am and what I am. Not because I am, but because of what I'm made to be. Mm-hmm. And maybe I don't own it. Maybe, you know, if I have to own what I am all by myself, then I'm either too short, too tall, too fat, too ugly. I'm... Uh, my eye coloring is wrong, my skin coloring is wrong. You know, I, I have to come up with a, some reason that makes me um, unique, and I can't do it in a society of comparisons. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. Yeah, we have to find, we have to find value in, in you know, and in, in, in an extension out of that is you can't really care about other people until you care about yourself. Because if you hold a low esteem of yourself, then you inherently hold a low esteem of everybody else. Well, you know, sometimes I think that's so true when we get to parent and child. Because like you said, uh, and I like one theory of psychology, it says that in me are three separate people. There is the adult, hopefully, there's the critical parent, and there's the child. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I 
reflect back to my child the same frustrations are reflected on me and that's from the critical parent in me who wants to always and is there alive criticizing all of my failure not based upon who or what the circumstances are but just because that's what I learned to be a critical parent yeah and you know what I find kind of what I found kind of amazing in, in my the short part of my life is uh you know, this idea that you should know the truth and the truth shall set you free. I never really understood that very well. Um, but what I'm finding as I start sorting through things, especially writing blogs and stuff like that, is that embracing truth for what it is and it oftentimes makes some of this stuff just go away. Through nothing else, no magical strategy, no great deep insight, just sometimes truth just makes these things go away. Accepting it, acknowledging it, seeing that it's there, the truth makes it go away. Yes. Now, I think the hardest thing at that, the transition, is sometimes people think the truth itself, belief in the truth, makes emotions go away. Mm -hmm. But to simply have the truth, my emotions are going to win ten times unless I go, no, that is the truth. I embrace it. I believe it. I live it. I die it. Well, and I'm, I'm not convinced in, in terms of emotional triggers that they ever go away. Um, I, I have yet to have experienced that. <laughs> no, I still like cheese. And, uh, <laughs> I will always like cheese. Yeah. And I always feel like I don't get cheese. And it's like I told Sarah, my and wife, when we got married. <laughs> you know, I opened the icebox one day and it was empty. And it basically empty. It had, you know, milk and other stuff. And then I said, no, I never want to see this icebox empty. I want it full. Because all my life, my icebox was empty, and there was nothing in it, and I came hungry, and I couldn't find anything. And I said, I always want it full. And she looked at me, and she said, how much money do you have? I said, <laughs> well, all I need. She said, go buy it. I'm like, no, I can't buy it. I can't fill my icebox. I was a kid. I couldn't fill my own icebox. And it's like, she's saying, but you're not a kid anymore. Yeah. And that's the truth, the reality that has to come. So, great. I think that's great, Vera. I always enjoy your insights. I think that's where people are. And I think that's where the scripture really is more profound than anything else. You know, there's, um, we've already been martyred. We just have to be able to see the truth of being martyred. Yep. So, great. Thanks so much. Thanks, Paul. Hey y'all, thanks for joining us for Around the Supper Table. At Sanctuary Family Farms, we want to be real. Whether that's through our blogs, daily verses, or even Nana's recipes, we want to share the messages that God has laid on each of our hearts. If you liked what you heard today or want to get in touch with us, you can find us on Facebook and YouTube at Sanctuary Family Farms or our website at www.sanctuaryfamilyfarms.com where we share our recipes and blogs and sell farm fresh beef and pork. We can't wait for you to join us again for next week's episode.